So last time I just gave you a, uh, a brief introduction to this. Uh, this is really the next part, uh, page 41 in uh, notes number 6. And we're going to start defining filters on the z-plane. So uh, that's going to unravel this mystery of how when you see a, uh, a filter response or even the, uh, the response of a system or a, a description of a, of a spectrum uh, or a spectral response, you'll see it given as some relatively small number of poles and zeros, complex coordinates. You know, they'll actually, uh, I, I think in, um, in seismic data files like uh, seed files, they'll uh, give the instrument response as usually uh, uh, five or six poles and, and zeros. Uh, and you'll see this list of, uh, of numbers in there. Now, um, that doesn't come in so much in our uh, exploration work, um, but it is starting to um, become a little bit more important as we uh, care more about amplitude and care a bit more about calibrating the responses of our, of our exploration seismic instruments. It also has uh, a lot to do with electromagnetic uh, work. Um, I think uh, radar uh, uh, responses and antennas are described in much the same way. Uh, now these filters uh, are, are all one-dimensional filters. You know, they work on individual time series. And if you have a whole bunch of time series to, uh, to apply them to, it, it doesn't matter what order you process those, those time series in. Um, you could send them all, you could send each time series for uh, filter convolution to a different uh, processor on your GPU, for instance. And it doesn't matter you know, that they're done simultaneously or, or in some sort of order. So we're really talking about this kind of one-dimensional filtering. And it's in the second half of this class I'll talk more about what is actually effectively two-dimensional convolution, two-dimensional filtering. And we'll, we'll start that with two-dimensional um, Fourier transforms and fast Fourier transforms. All right, so uh, Clairbaut introduces this topic by, by saying, OK, let's consider a couple of simple filters. And the first one we'll look at is this one that the, the time series associated with the filter is 1 minus 1. And what we're going to try to figure out here is what kind of filter is this? OK, uh, and um, so it has a z transform 1 minus z. Okay, two-term polynomial, and if we uh, uh, take that uh, against a uh, much longer, much larger polynomial with many more terms, obviously representing a time series that's much longer, and the coefficients of each term, you know, with z to some power, uh, if those coefficients are all one, okay, then we have a time series that's just ones all the way through. And if we, you know, multiply the one minus z polynomial by that. Uh, uh, that constant coefficient polynomial, or we convolve 1 minus 1 as a time series against this constant time series, then what we are essentially doing is differentiating that time series. And if we differentiate a constant function, we should get 0, right? So uh, that's uh, uh, really the, what's demonstrated here. And you can try it by, by multiplying out the polynomial um, a bit. Um, and, or you can uh, try it as a time series using the convolutional uh, summation. So uh, what we're uh, uh, what we're getting now, uh, what 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 should a differentiator do? Okay. So clearly, if we have a constant component in our time series, uh, what I might call a DC or direct current component, then it's going to zero that out. All right. So uh, actually, it's what we would call a um, a low cut filter. It's removing the low frequency. Okay. Now it's it's as it'll turn out. It's not removing all of the low frequency. I mean, however we define low, um, uh, but it is certainly removing the zero frequency. Any energy that's associated with a constant um, level, you know, any any overall bias or average in our seismogram. Uh, this differentiator as a filter will remove. Okay, now 
this uh, this filter polynomial in the z domain, uh, it's a it's a very simple polynomial. Okay, and we can naturally ask the question: What is the root of that polynomial? You know, where does that um, you know if we, we can write the equation? Okay, the uh, the filter the function of, of z is equal to one minus z. Okay, where does the filter go to zero? Where does f of z goes to zero? Well, that's when z is equal to the root, and obviously, uh, for the polynomial one minus z, the single root is z zero or z naught, as I'll sometimes call it. Is uh, that's the uh, the value of z at the root? Okay, and and the value of z at the root is one. With no imaginary part. Okay, so now we can plot this on in the z plane, and of course it's on the unit circle. And um, uh, what frequency is that at? Well, the frequency is really the angle from uh, uh, from the real axis, and it's on the real axis, so it's at frequency zero. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll, um, uh, I'll call this root a zero because it's where the the polynomial goes to zero, and and maybe it's starting to make sense that uh, uh, that a zero a root of a polynomial as a filter, okay, is going to zero out, you know, the the energy uh, that that comes through that filter at that frequency, okay. Now there's another way of uh, of writing uh, of of graphing where this Zero is, and that's the way that's represented on um, the uh, the z plane uh, function in uh, in the ViewMat code. Okay, and so in uh, I think in lab two you get an introduction to uh, to z plane uh, uh, certainly by lab three. So um, um, now z plane uh, does not show you where the um, well, okay. First of all, z-plane allows you to compose filters and spectra out of poles and zeros. So, if you're wondering what something does and what the spectrum of the filter, or the spectral response of the filter looks like, you can enter it or draw it into z-plane. You know, click on the places where you want the roots, uh, and and then you can see the spectrum and you can apply that filter to any data set you want. Any uh, any. Yeah, well, any data set that, that you can read into ViewMat. So certainly all seismic uh, and seismogram data sets, and you could even apply it to a map if you wanted to. Um, but the um, uh, z-plane does not have a direct view of this z-plane here with the unit circle. What it does is it kind of unwraps the unit circle and draws it in this way, where the um, uh, the horizontal axis is frequency, and if you in the z-plane tool, if you point to to any place you know within the uh, the field um, that uh, that has uh, this um, uh, you know above the axes, okay, it will it will show you the uh, the frequency in, in hertz, you know according to the data set you're looking at. And and the y-axis, the vertical axis, I haven't defined yet, but it, that vertical axis in z-plane is used for uh, plotting uh, the distance uh, outside the unit circle, uh, and it's also used for plotting the uh, the uh, the spectral power, or maybe the magnitude of the uh, of the spec of the uh, the amplitude spectrum. Uh, another thing that z-plane does is it does not show you the negative frequency side of the um, of this plane, and that's a um, um, uh, there there's reasons for that that I'll that I'll go uh, into uh, uh, pretty soon. Okay, so this root this zero, which appears here on the uh, unit circle, appears at zero frequency. And it's you know represented as a as a capital Z um, on on the z-plane type plot, and it appears at a characteristic frequency or omega zero equal to zero. All right. So that's uh, 
you know, a complete z-plane definition of this, um, uh, a complete z-plane definition of this, um, uh, of this differentiator filter. All right. Well, you may be wondering, uh, okay, I got a differentiator. Can I make an integrator? And you can. You can make a simple integrator uh, as the uh, uh, and it's z it's uh, z polynomial is one plus z, and of course uh, uh, this integrator has a zero has a root where f of z is zero, which of course is at z naught equal to minus one. And on the unit circle, that's found at omega equals pi. Okay, z zero equals minus one. It has no uh, imaginary part, and we find that on the z plane type plot, um, and we look first at the positive frequency part, and we find it at pi. Uh, I mean, uh, formally it should be pi delta t, but you know, here for simplicity, we're taking delta t equals one. Um, and the uh, uh, omega zero is equal to pi, um, and and so we have to be aware that if we're plotting the negative frequency part, this same zero there's not two zeros here. This same zero is also appearing at negative pi. Okay, so it's weird. I got to plot it twice, but there's really only one. Okay. Um, now you you may remember from algebra. That every polynomial of order n, okay, and we've we've been looking at these first order polynomials, right? They have two terms, and they're in terms of uh, the two terms are in, are in terms of uh, you know this is the one is the coefficient of z to the zeroth power, and minus one is the coefficient of z to the first power, okay. So uh, the highest power of z that we have in these polynomials is. Um, is z to the uh, first power, so it's a first order polynomial in z, and so it's got um, one root. So polynomial of order n, uh, which has n plus one terms, has n roots. Okay. Now they they are not necessarily all different. You know, they you, you might find that all the roots are at exactly the same spot on the z plane. Okay, even if there's a million of them, they could be exactly the same place. So they're not all distinct, but uh, there are there are n of them. So uh, get this, uh, you know, imagine you have that month-long seismogram, you know, which is you know it's going to have two billion and one samples, and so it's going to have two billion roots, and you could you know you could represent that month-long seismogram uh, as a z polynomial. And just think, if you could factor it, then you would find the two billion uh, roots that uh, that represent that month-long seismogram. So we're you know we're not worried about about having you know million-dimensional data, billion-dimensional data. We're not worried about having uh, a billion terms in our in our z polynomials. We're not worried about about having um, a um, uh, a billion roots on our on our z plane. Um, we can, uh, you know, we, we can handle all that with code, um, and and I might get a chance. Uh, I may have to cut it short, but I might get a chance to talk a little bit about factoring gigantic uh, polynomials. Okay, how do you actually do that? Uh, it's not not necessarily simple, um, but uh, there are some pretty well established ways, and they work for arbitrary sized um, uh, time series. Okay, so uh, uh, let's say we apply this integrator one plus z to again to our um, uh, uh, no we're applying it to a new series. Look at this series. Okay, this z polynomial, the coefficient of z to the first power is one. The coefficient of z to the second power is minus one. The coefficient of z to the third power is one. The coefficient of z to the minus I'm sorry to the z to the fourth power is minus one. All right, so this is like the um, this is like an oscillation at the Nyquist frequency. It's bouncing between one minus one, one minus one. So that's exactly at the Nyquist frequency. 
Okay, that's all this contains is is an oscillation at the Nyquist frequency. Uh, you know, two times uh, delta t is its period. Um, so, uh, uh, what if we applied this integrator to uh, to this uh, you know Nyquist oscillation? All right, so we have f of z uh, as a polynomial times this this Nyquist polynomial, and we're going to get zero. Right. If you go ahead and multiply out some some terms, you'll find that that you get zero. Okay. So uh, uh, whereas the differentiator was a low cut filter, the integrator, as you might expect, is a high cut filter. It smooths things out. It removes the high frequencies. It removes the rapid oscillations. All right. Because it's got a zero at the Nyquist frequency. Okay, a zero at pi, which is the Nyquist frequency. All right. Now, now, if if that was all we had, okay, um, on on the on the unit circle, right? There's only, you know, all these roots are going to plot on the unit circle, and and on the unit circle, there's only two possible roots that are all real, right? There's one and minus one. That's all we get. So if we want to do any other filtering, and if we want to be at all clever about our filtering and like split the difference, you know, what if I want to filter half the Nyquist frequency? I want to get rid of half the Nyquist frequency. Or, or let's say the Nyquist frequency is, is 10,000 10, uh, 10, hertz, and I want to get rid of uh, 60 hertz, because you know, on my seismograms, I'm seeing a lot of uh, electrical interference. Uh, you know, in New Zealand, you would see 50 hertz interference. New Zealand, Australia, um, you know. So I, I, I don't want to take out zero frequency. I don't want to take out the Nyquist frequency. I want to take out this other frequency. So we got to be somewhere else on the unit circle, and we're going to have a complex root. It's going to have to be on the unit circle. It's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to have a non-zero imaginary component. So. Uh, uh, let's say we're 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 looking to remove um, omega zero equal to pi over two half the Nyquist frequency. We want to get rid of that. All right. So um, um, here's uh, here's a wave. Let's see. No, I'm sorry. Uh, here I'm defining the root in terms of this Euler exponential, right? So I'm defining the root, in t uh, and and this is a this is like a initial definition. Okay, and and we're going to see a, a more common way of of defining roots with the Euler exponential, but but bear with bear with me for a moment here. All we need now is we want to put a root on the unit circle, and and we want to um, uh, we want it to have um, to appear at the angle omega zero, which is actually omega zero delta t, right? Uh, which is uh, 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 which is uh, you know maybe going to be at, at pi over two, okay? So so uh, you know we let's expand out the uh, uh, e to the i omega zero, okay? And uh, of course it's equal to you know cosine pi over two plus i sine pi over two, all right? The cosine of pi over two is zero, so there's no real part in this case. And the sine of pi over two is one, so our root is equal to i, or zero plus i if you if you want to keep it written out complex. All right. Um, okay. Now let's uh, let's build that into a polynomial. Okay. This is the uh, the root of uh, one minus z over z naught, and if we if z naught is i. Right, then uh, one over i is minus i. Okay, so uh, the actual polynomial is uh, one plus i z. Okay, uh, and and so now we know we know the um, uh, we know the time series that this uh, that this pi over two omega zero equals pi over two filter uh, represents. Okay, so the filter's time series is one, comma i. So we've got 
you know, the first sample is all real. The next sample is all imaginary. Kind of a weird time series. Uh, pretty non-physical. Um, so uh, uh, okay, what can we do with that, right? If we if we are using our physical model, we we get data y, which is uh, the filter uh, polynomial times the input polynomial x. Okay, uh, we have uh, and we're essentially convolving the input time series little x with the filter time series little f, and we're getting out a time series little y. Okay, and if so, if the filter is complex, then the output time series, you know, y of t will also be complex, and and we really don't want that, right? I mean, what are we going to do with uh, with a complex seismogram? I mean, there are some things we can do with it, but but just to you know to to take a real seismogram and filter it, end up with a complex seismogram, you know, we can't use that. Um, so um, we'll avoid complex filters. By using complementary roots, complex conjugate roots. All right. So we really need two filters. We need two roots. One is at plus pi over two, and the other one is at minus pi over two. Okay. They are complex conjugates of, either, of each other. You know, the first root z naught is equal to i. And then the second root is z naught conjugate, which of course is just minus i. All right. Uh, and and here's where we're actually starting to make use of this mysterious negative frequency part. Okay. We need that um, because what it's going to do for us is that you know we multiply by. All right. So so let me compose the filter now. I've got. One um, z polynomial, which is one plus i z, and I've got another z polynomial, the other the complex conjugate uh, root, which is one minus i z. Okay, multiply them together, right? So we got one squared uh, plus i z minus i z. Okay, so uh, there's no you know the coefficient of of z to the first power in the product is uh, zero, and then I have uh, plus i z times minus i z. So i times i is minus one, and minus one times that is one, and z times z is is uh, z squared. Okay. So so by putting these two by multiplying these two complex conjugate roots, uh, complex conjugate polynomials together. Okay, which are made from complex conjugate complementary roots. All right, um, we get one plus z squared. We get an entirely real filter uh, time series, an entirely real filter uh, z polynomial. Right, the 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 time series here is one zero one. Right. Because there's uh, zero times z to the first power, and then one times z to the second power. Okay, and this will have this will have the effect we want. It allows us to get rid of pi over two uh, frequencies. Uh, and now, you know, we are showing two different roots here. Okay, this is the z-plane type plot. Here's the Nyquist frequency, which is at pi. And here's our root at pi over two. Here's our other root at minus pi over two. Okay, and it's only at you know minus pi that we'd be repeating you know anything that we had at pi. But these are not repeated. There's actually two different roots, and since they are the complex conjugates of each other, we get a real filter. All right, and so then the um, so then the uh, uh, the complex um, and then the uh, uh, the filtered data y is going to be real. Okay, we have a real filter and then real output. So uh, um, that's uh, that's going to underlie, and, and and that's why in z plane you only see this uh, quarter of the uh, of the plane. 
Okay, you only see positive uh, positive omega because for any root that's not at zero, you know, if it's at zero, you know, it's at the positive and the negative frequency, right? Zero is both places. If it's at the Nyquist at pi, it's you know that one root is at both places. But as soon as we place a, a root or a pole uh, in z-plane off uh, the zero frequency axis or away from pi, then automatically z-plane adds in that complementary root, that complex conjugate, and uh, and creates real output for us. You know, and that allows z-plane to do the filtering and without having to show us the imaginary part of the product because it's um, uh, it's all zero. Okay, so uh, um, you know even though uh, even though Z, the z-plane program is not showing you these these complementary roots at negative um, frequencies, uh, they are there, and and uh, because they're always complementary, uh, it only has to show you the positive omega part of the z-plane. All right, so so now let's let's work on a kind of general uh, representation for a complex root z naught. Okay, uh, so z naught uh, can take uh, we can give it in a few different forms. We have um, uh, we can just give its complex coordinates x plus i y right uh, as we've uh, as we've done, um, and of course that's the real part of the root plus i times the imaginary part of the root. Uh, we can we can uh, we can write this root in polar form if it's convenient for us, and and the uh, the Euler exponential is very good at helping us do that because uh, it it kind of packages up the sine the cosine and sine very neatly into a much more compact representation. So we have the the omega zero that's the uh, the the frequency, the central frequency of this of this root, okay, the characteristic. Let's call it the characteristic frequency of the root, okay. So here we have the, the complex root z naught, and its um, uh, its characteristic uh, frequency is taken as the imaginary exponent of e. So really, this is uh, cosine omega zero uh, plus i sine omega zero. Uh, and then we divide by the real number rho, okay, and and rho is the um, rho is the uh, uh, is the inverse, and and maybe it'll become clearer later why we use the inverse of the of the magnitude of the complex number, uh, but um, um, that's what's uh, What's in Clairbaut's books, and, and it's pretty generally generally used as well. So when you see rho in the in the z-plane uh, program, uh, you know you point anywhere in the z-plane, it gives you the rho, it gives you the omega zero, uh, and so forth. Um, the uh, the rho is the inverse of the of the distance of the of the root from the origin. So of course, if it's on the um, uh, if it's um, if the root is on the unit circle, then rho is one, and you don't see it. If the root is inside the unit circle, rho is greater than one. If the root is outside the unit circle, rho is less than one. Okay, uh, and and uh, you know rho really never goes to um, really never goes to zero. Um, you know, we we'd have to be infinitely far from the uh, uh, we'd have, we have to be infinitely far from the unit circle to uh, for rho to go to zero. Uh, and there are of course dire consequences if we make you know if we put the root at the origin, then rho is infinite and and you know this representation is totally invalid. And and so there's problems. Um, okay, so we define z naught in this way. We can define then uh, z naught conjugate, the conjugate root, the complementary root, as e very simply e to the minus i omega zero over the same row. 
same omega zero, same rho. We're just taking it, you know, down on the frequency into the negative frequency uh, part instead of uh, to the uh, positive frequency part. Ah, now here's a here's a little piece of uh, uh, of math which you will come back to, and I and I. When I wrote these notes, I neglected to put the result here in a box. But for uh, I think for lab two, you're going to need this equation um, quite a bit. All right, and and we'll we'll get around to explaining exactly what it is. Um, okay, so um, let's put together the whole filter that's made out of this one root and its conjugate root. Okay, so uh, we have here, you know, here's the z polynomial for 1 minus z over z0, and here's the z polynomial, which is 1 minus z over z0 conjugate. So we got the root, we got the conjugate root. Okay, you multiply the polynomial out, you get 1 minus 1 over z0 plus 1 over z0 conjugate times z um, uh, plus z squared times 1 over z0 times z0 conjugate, and then you work through. The, uh, these definitions, right? In terms of the Euler exponentials, you put, you sort of plug them in. You get, uh, and we're writing a z polynomial here, right? So here's a simple, you know, single root filter that has its complex conjugate root in there, okay? And the z polynomial for it is one minus two rho cosine omega zero times z, okay, plus rho squared times z squared. So this is a, a, a time series, right? That's the z transform of this time series down here, which is a, a filter time series. It's got three, it's got three time samples in it. You know, at zero time, the co it the 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 amplitude is one. At at uh, one delta t, uh, right? The coefficient of z to the first power, it's minus two times rho times the cosine of omega zero. Now, now, what is that? That's that's a real number, right? That's uh, it's you know, one is is all real. Minus two rho is real. The cosine gives a, a real number. Okay, so the this is a real series, all real, right? Rho squared, rho is a real number. Rho squared is a real number. Okay. Um, and a. Uh, uh, Another way to uh, um, um, okay now now we'll we'll talk about uh, in a bit about the spectrum of this but but here's you know here's how you get this you know so so right away we could define all we have to do is define omega zero and we define our row and we'll we'll work with the rows uh, later on um, and, and we know what effect omega zero has. And right away we can compose a uh, uh, I don't know maybe I could term this a wide band cut filter. It's going to remove energy around omega zero. Okay, and um, um, and and this is you know this it's entirely defined here. We know what it's we know what its filter time series is. We know what its z transform is, and we'll talk about the. Uh, uh, We'll talk about the uh, Fourier transform in a sec. Um, so for uh, uh, for uh, rho equals one, it'll turn out. You know, if we put the the root on the unit circle, there's going to be exactly zero energy left at at exactly omega zero. It will remove all the energy at the characteristic frequency. For rho close to one, you know, near the the uh, uh, the unit circle uh, and and it doesn't have to it can be inside or it can be outside but if it's near the unit circle then we have a suppression of frequencies near omega zero okay and if it's uh, um, um, uh, and if it's you know the closer it is to the 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 closer row is to one the closer the root is to the unit circle and the more suppression of frequencies we get. Okay, uh, of those frequencies near omega zero, do we get? Um, and in z-plane, you know, uh, if we put the root exactly on the horizontal axis over here, 
then it's going to be a uh, you know it's going to be on the unit circle. That's you know so now uh, in a way we we're going to be plotting rho um, up here, and rho is one here, and uh, and rho is less than one going up. Okay, so that's a little weird. Um, you know, but we're getting further outside the unit circle as we go up in this in this quadrant that um, uh, that the um, um, that the z plane program uh, gives us to work with. All right. So uh, uh, you know we've got we've got a tool here now, right? We can we can build up, um, and I'll, I'll get to the the you know the characteristic spectrum of the filter. In a bit, but we got everything we need right here. We can filter at any frequency, and we can build we can build a free, we can build a filter out of as many roots as we want, as many different frequencies and rows as we want. And all all, all they're going to be is kind of cascaded filters, and each filter at each frequency, you know, has its conjugate root and has this time series. So, you know, if you have a million um, roots on the uh, on the positive omega side, then you're going to have a million of these filters, just one applied after the other. Okay, and and that's very simple to uh, you know to to figure out the effect of uh, every everything you know all the math you need is right here. Um, and and so um, uh, anything any filter that we build out of roots and zeros is now entirely defined. Okay, now I also talked. To, I also mentioned poles when I um, uh, when I introduced this this section, and um, I, I need to kind of ease you gently into the concept of a pole. Okay, um, you know a root is where the Fourier trans. I'm sorry, a root is where the um, the z polynomial goes to zero. Okay, and a pole is something different. The z polynomial actually goes to um, actually goes to infinity. Okay, and a pole is involved in 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 what's called rational filters, which means that we are we have a z polynomial on the top on a numerator, and we're dividing. One polynomial by another polynomial that's in a denominator, and the roots of the denominator polynomial are going to end up being called poles. Okay, so so I'm, I'm going to try to sort of gently approach with examples this concept of dividing one polynomial from another, which is going to essentially mean inverse filtering. You know, how do you invert a filter? Well. It can be a, it can be you can put a filter in the denominator. Okay, that's a way of inverting a filter, um, and that's gonna you know. So I'm gonna lead you gently to this concept of a pole because it involves all these new concepts of you know deconvolution and inverse filtering and polynomial division, uh, and and you're thinking, wow, if it's hard to factor a polynomial. Uh, into roots. I mean, how are we ever going to find a way to divide polynomials? Turns out that it's pretty easy, actually. Okay, uh, but there's you know we we run in, we can run into problems. Okay, and we have to know what what to avoid there. Okay, so uh, we're really moving to chapter three of the text now. Um, and because there's there's all these new concepts, all right. So as Clairbaut does, I'll 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 kind of pull out these examples of simple things uh, that are uh, that are illustrative of some of the basic concepts, and I'm, and I'm pulling them out of kind of left field, um, but uh, hopefully they will, along with with the codes like ED. Uh, I'm sorry. The codes like uh, FFT Lab, the codes like Zplane, they will help you get your mind around, you know, what this is and then how it works. Okay, that's why, you know, that's why I, I 
I adapted the z-plane code for you and got it working in modern computers because, you know, okay, it's one, one thing to hear me drone on in my lecture. Uh, it's another thing to do some homework and do some algebra with these roots and, and poles and zeros and all that. Uh, but it's a, the really useful thing is to be able to actually put some poles and zeros on the z-plane and then filter some data with it and see what happens. So I'm hoping that you'll, you know, you'll, you won't stop at just exactly what I asked you to do in the, in the labs, and you'll kind of play with these codes a bit and, and uh, uh, you know, really experiment. You know, try making some crazy filter and see what it does to the data. You know, uh, you've got all that, all that latitude. And if you want some help getting, you know, whatever data set of your own you have into into Z-Plane, I'd, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to help you. Um, yeah, Z, Z -plane, one advance I made is that Z-Plane used to be uh, only have one example data set. Uh, it was a seismic exploration data set, so it was pretty good. But it's, um, you know, I really wanted you guys to be able to uh, concoct your own filters and try it on your own data sets if you have them. So uh, be glad to help you get your data in. Um, ViewMat, which is the way you run Z-Plane, it'll read SegY, it'll read SAC, um, it'll read ASCII seismograms, uh, it'll read uh, you know kind of raw binary seismograms. So um, there's uh, at least we're getting uh, seismogram data in. It's it's fairly fairly adaptable. Uh, be glad to help you guys get your own data in. Okay, now we got to define we got to define some some uh, terms here, okay? Um, because what we're uh, uh, what we're going to address is this topic of feedback, and again, approaching it gently. Um, be because uh, you know why why is this chapter introduced with uh, feedback? Is because that's actually going to be the mechanism that allows us to do polynomial division fairly simply. Okay. Um, you know, without without you know formally endless computation. Okay. So I got to define a few things to uh, uh, figure out just what feedback means in this context. A uh, a causal filter. Okay. So uh, get the idea that there are different families, categories of filters, and 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 don't forget that. Every time series can be a filter. So what we're really getting at is that uh, we're not just defining filters and, and setting them into different families. We're, um, we're, we're defining all time series and setting them into different families. Okay? And it turns out our data, you know, which come from physics observations, um, our data will be categorizable as a particular kind of time series and thus a particular kind of filter. So even our data are really a filter and, and they'll have a certain classification with certain properties. All right. So a causal filter produces output based on previous input, not later input. Okay. So, so if you imagine building a, a circuit which does that filtering, Okay, not not doing the filtering in the computer as we're always going to do here. Okay, but actually building a circuit that does filtering. You know, the the, the circuit is seeing is seeing the waves come in. Okay, and there's no way that that circuit can anticipate or make use of data that has not come in yet. Okay, and so so a, um, uh, an equivalent in terms of uh, of of actual devices is a realizable filter. A realizable filter is causal, okay, and 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 what that means is that it's um, well, okay. So so we call it realizable because we we might do um, we might do uh, uh, things with it that are not limited to cause and effect physics. So realizable means all realizable means is that you could build a circuit out of inductors, resistors, capacitors, 
that would take a continuous you know voltage input and 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 do that filter. That's a realizable filter. You could I mean it might cost a million dollars in parts, but you could build it. Okay, it might cost twenty cents in parts. Um, and a uh, uh, a causal filter means that you know no energy arrives before the P wave. Okay, it just can't happen. You know that's 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 physical causality. All right, and um, and so if you want a if you want to do filtering that doesn't you know spread out the uh, the energy to before the first arrival P arrival time, right, which I mean, a seismologist can can recognize the value of doing that, okay, of that limitation. Um, then it's, you're going to be building causal filters. You don't want the filter to like pick up something that's you know something that's high amplitude and very late in the seismogram, and and mistakenly put it early in the seismogram. That's non-causal. And we actually have to define you know how filters can be causal and what can cause cause them to not be causal. Okay, so the uh, the causal filter produces this output based on only previous input, no later input. Okay, at time you know thirty point thirty four point seven six seconds, it's only you know it can only work on the output that has been received at thirty four point seven six seconds or before. Okay, that's a causal filter, and causal filters are realizable in. Uh, generally realizable in uh, electronic circuits, you know, analog electronic circuits. Okay, a filter using feedback, okay, subtle difference here, produces output based on previous output. And if you've uh, if you've taken any electronics and you built an active filter, okay. An active filter uses feedback. That's that's an analog circuit. An active filter. An active filter uses feedback to produce output based on on previous input and previous output. You know, an active filter actually has a way of, you know, in in a way saving its its um, its previous output. Okay, but it's still causal. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, and it's still realizable. Okay, that's why you can build an active filter. Uh, I think it takes uh, you know uh, a couple capacitors, a few resistors, and one transistor for a simple active filter. All right. So um, uh, uh, so out of the out of the uh, out of the category of causal filters, you know, we make an equivalent. An equivalent category is a realizable filter, okay. Um, and uh, one subcategory of causal filters are feedback filters, or as as you might uh, uh, as you might have heard the term recursive. All right. Now, as we you know, we have to be when we're doing filtering in the computer. We do have to be careful to um, uh, to make sure our filters are causal. If we need causal filters, we got to take we got to take steps to make sure they're causal. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and in the computer, um, in the computer, it's 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 all too easy, all too possible to do uh, non-causal filtering, right? Because you got the whole time series, you record it ahead of time, and you're filtering it all at once. So you get all you get all time available to you. You don't have to do a causal filter, um, and 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 so it's an easy thing. You know, since it's an easy thing to have a non-causal filter, it's also an easy thing to have a feedback, a recursive filter, and and the recursive the recursion becomes clear when you look at the 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 computer codes. Uh, you know, if you're used to defining recursion in terms of uh, algorithms, uh, that becomes clear. You know, when we get this down to a computer code. Okay, so here is convolution that uh, uh, is causal. Okay, it is defined such that we never look at future input. All right, so we have our filter. That's you know that's known. Okay, but uh, uh, our output at every time k 
uh, depends only on the input at time k or before, right? k minus i. And i starts at 0 and goes up to some maximum, uh, the length of the filter, actually. Okay, so it's looking at the current, you know, x at, at uh, k equals 0, that's the current input. We can use that. And x at, um, at, at k uh, um, at, uh, uh, um, at k minus 1, k minus 2, that's previous input. Okay, x is the input series, y is the output series. Okay, now um, so that's just to just to you know confirm in your uh, with a definition what a causal filter would be doing a causal uh, output uh, a causal filter oh and it's eleven fifty one.